Welcome to John Jay College of Criminal Justice. My name is Jeremy Travis. I'm privileged to be the uh, president of uh, this remarkable institution. Uh, and on behalf of uh, Lars Anderson and the DA's office uh, and my colleagues here, John Jay, I, I welcome you to this uh, conference uh, for saying a few things about uh, our wonderful partnership with the DA's office. Let me take the uh, moment that I have with the microphone to say uh, some wonderful things. So just to give you a sense of where you are and uh, what this college is all about. Uh, this is a college almost 50 years old. Uh, this building was opened two years ago, so uh, this is the expanded campus of John Jay. Please spend some time getting to know us. Two doctoral programs, nine master's programs. Most of us are our graduates. And most of them, I'm very happy to say, are New York City kids. Uh, come from New York City public schools. They come here, they're hungry, they're ambitious. 40% of them were born in another country, uh, three quarters of them students of color, uh, and they want to make a difference in the world. And that's why they come here. Our job is to help them find their way, and they go off and do great things. That are very, very proud of our alumni. And some of them even work in Manhattan Inside. Uh, and if you want some of them to work in your organization, come talk to us. Uh, it's, it's a hard time to get out of college uh, and try to find a job, and you have students with special expertise and a lot of drawing a lot of smarts and good education. So that's always something that we'd like to talk about. Uh, secondly, we have great faculty here. We'll meet some of them uh, today uh, who have a range of uh, scholarly interests. Um, we're a little arts scholars, so we have English faculty, and history historians, uh, but their interests also tend to be in areas of uh, justice or conflict or human rights uh, and the like. So also, please feel free to be in touch with us if you'd like to be in uh, contact with uh, some of our so to the matter at hand, we have uh, over the uh, four years that he's been uh, district attorney of New York County, developed uh, a relationship with uh, Cyrus Vance and his staff that is uh, just quite wonderful from our point of view. It's wonderful because it allows us to bring people like you to our college, which is always good, but it's more importantly wonderful in terms of our ability to think substantively uh, in a partnership way about the important issues uh, facing our city uh, our faculty are working together, we have students uh, working in the VA's office, uh, and at a, at a strategic level to uh, be part of the uh, discussions within the VA's office about uh, what is the approach to uh, the issues facing uh, our country. This VA's office, as you know, has a long history of uh, excellence, uh, being the best uh, local VA's office in the country, back to uh, predecessors, Watertown, Hogan, uh, and uh, what is just great to watch is how Cy Vance has continued that, that tradition, uh, given it a uh, modern, up-to-date uh, twist and uh, sense of urgency and creativity. Uh, Cy Vance is known nationally as an innovator, as a man of high integrity, uh, as somebody who uh, puts the opportunity given by like two elected officials to do the best for the people who elected him, uh, and has shown that time and time again uh, in the time that he's served as DA. Relationship with the, with the community is stronger than they've ever been. Relationships with the police department are, are strong and collaborative. Relationships with academic institutions are, are strong. Uh, and the proof is in the pudding. Uh, there are good things happening in terms of lower crime rates in, in our county, in Manhattan, uh, and very good things happening in terms of the way that the court system functioning from a public citizen point of view. And that's a true leadership. Leadership matters. Uh, so it's in that spirit that I'm uh, delighted to welcome to the podium uh, a very, very important public official in our country and in our city, a uh, good friend and a great leader, uh, to kick off this conference on cybercrime and uh, intellectual property rights in the digital age, uh, Cyrus Vance.
all the work that you are doing uh, and the collaboration that we have had with Jeremy described, whether it is in sex trafficking or, or uh, crime prevention strategies. John Jay is the laboratory that we in the DA's office frequently turn to in terms of our exploration of the intersection between policy and practice and criminal law. And I also want to return the compliments to Jeremy Travis. When I ran for DA, Jeremy was one of those people who I, whose guidance I sought uh, as to where the opportunities were uh, to take the DA's office to the next level in a first century world. And Jeremy, you have been incredible to me personally. Uh, under your leadership, John Jay, it's been a great collaboration with our office. I also work uh, as you do with Jeremy's wife, Susan. And so it's been a full, uh, full partnership, and we really appreciate it. As I said, uh, John Jay last year, in terms of our work together, uh, hosted a groundbreaking sex trafficking conference right in this very room. Uh, and before that, we collaborated with John Jay on a summit uh, that brought DAs from all over the country and policy experts, uh, community leaders, and advocates to share ideas and strategies on how we can improve public safety. Again, that intersection between enforcement and crime prevention, which I really think is the key, whether you're in the federal arena or the state arena, balance of those two, I think, gets us the best results in terms of uh, making our community safer and enhancing the relationship between the communities and law enforcement so that we are working in concert. And I'm looking forward to partnering with John Jay for many years in the future. And we're also very fortunate to have a diverse audience with us today, and I thank each of you very much for coming. Uh, in, the, in this room, you are individuals uh, from brand holders, technology firms, financial institutions, government agencies, federal and state, uh, and, and many others. Uh, and I think it's this kind of collaboration that, again, is what is going to make us successful in the future. Certainly, uh, our collaboration with the federal partners has never been better, uh, and I appreciate their, their partnership, uh, our state partners, but I think also the business community. And what I've really seen as DA is the opportunity to partner with industry and its executives because there is so much that we share in common in terms of community safety, uh, safety in the marketplace, and I think that business and the DA's office and law enforcement uh, really are national partners, and we are very proud of the work that we're doing together with you. I'd like to mention a few special guests who are here this morning, and that is Kathleen McGee, who is director of the Mayor's Office of Special Enforcement. I don't know where Kathleen is. Uh, She's not here now. I hope she'll be here soon. <laughs> and Nakim Aponmat, who is a representative of the Motion Picture Association of America and a technical advisor to the Nigerian Copyright Commission. Uh, and thank you, I think, for being here this morning. We have some distinguished guest speakers here this morning who I'd like to just mention. Uh, a friend of ours and a friend of our office and a, one of the thought leaders in the cyberspace and uh, intellectual property arena, Eric Freeberg, who's co-president of Strode's Freeberg a law firm here based in New York, and Brian Brocate, who is treasurer of the International Anti-Counterfeiting Coalition and also a partner at the Gibney, Anthony, and Flaherty Law Firm. Uh, so, before I turn it over to the panel, I have a few minutes to talk with you about some bigger picture issues. And we start with the biggest picture relevant to this conference, and that is uh, some statistics. According to the United States International Trade Administration, uh, counterfeiting and piracy cost the American economy somewhere between 200 and $250 billion per year, and a loss of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of jobs. So that's the backdrop uh, against which we convene today uh, to talk about intellectual property theft in the digital age in all its very forms. What we see, and I think you see, is that the intellectual property thief today is no longer the person who is selling false Mark Jacobs bags on Canal Street or peddling like DVDs on a street corner, although those things are still happening today. But the modern intellectual property thief is stealing a copyright, a trademark, a patent, a trade secret, or sensitive proprietary information. And this intrusion is largely happening online, and it's happening more than ever before. This audience well knows a cybercrime and identity theft uh, are probably the fastest growing crimes in the country. That is certainly the case in Manhattan, where it's the most frequently reported crime in, in our precincts in Manhattan. And I, I'm 
I, I, I say this often, but I think it, I'm always reminded of it. When I was a young assistant DA and over the last uh, many years, I have always thought of crime scenes as a squad car rolling up to a street corner in Manhattan with yellow do not disturb tape around it. And that's really how we define a crime scene in my mind, and I think in the mind of the whole generation. But today, the reality is that uh, if you want to know where a crime scene of the 21st century is, it's online and it's on the internet. And that's why we're here today. And to aggressively deal with this online and international threat, uh, our office created the Cyber Crime and Identity Theft Bureau in 2010 to centralize all our investigative resources uh, and personnel in one area. In our office, what I've also observed after nearly four years is it doesn't matter whether it's a homicide, whether it's a sexual assault case, or whether it's a business crime case or an international fraud case. Cybercrime uh, and, and, and the computer and uh, the, uh, the digital uh, space occupies all of these crime characteristics. Every case involves some kind of digital evidence, uh, no matter the nature of the case. So we are seeing in our office the need to be proficient in cybercrime forensics, whether it's an intellectual property matter, a homicide, or uh, another street crime. Uh, our office and the intellectual uh, and the cybercrime bureau is also involved now in investigating the possibility of intellectual property crimes in light of the increase in both digital piracy and theft of digital intellectual property. And because of how easily business information is stored and used, current and former employees of businesses, and you see this all the time, are able to access an ever-expanding amount of sensitive and proprietary information. Mostly we see this in the area of theft by insiders associated with the business as employees, uh, but these insiders, uh, their crimes not only impact the bottom line of the companies that they victimize, but also has a broader impact in terms of the other employees of the company, uh, the profitability of the company, the ability of the company to to hire and to expand, so it actually affects a much broader <coughs> arena than simply the corporation itself. And we saw this in our office recently in, uh, in an interesting and, uh, and, and uh, I think apropos case involving a former IT employee at the Gucci of America Corporation. And that employee uh, intruded the fashion company's database, which led to the shutdown of every computer in Gucci's office locally uh, during the holiday season. And the defendant in that case used a, uh, an account that he had secretly created during his tenure in the firm to access the company's computers remotely. And as a result of that intrusion, Gucci lost access to documents email during the holiday season for nearly 24 hours. And other documents and emails were permanently deleted. To a company in a retail business, to lose access to your uh, computer uh, for a 24 hour period during the holiday season probably <coughs> like weeks and months to death. But that's the reality of what we're dealing with here, and, and you, uh, you will you represent industry know exactly the impact that cyber intrusions and piracy have on your businesses. And so we organized this conference to discuss how we can better protect collectively intellectual property rights, which is critical to our nation's economy and to your businesses. The U.S. Commerce Department noted that the IP industries in the country support at least 40 million jobs and contribute more than $5 trillion to the U.S. gross domestic product. Uh, the threats to intellectual property rights are obviously very different today than they were when I served as an assistant attorney in the Manhattan DA's office in the 1980s. Uh, back then, when we talked about intellectual property issues, we focused on small-time peddlers, Imitation apparel and design merchandise. So now, fast forwarding almost 30 years, what's changed? Number one, the criminals are not limited to a particular geographic area anymore. Far from it. They are working throughout the world uh, from behind uh, a computer uh, as a firewall and out of the public's view and often out of the view of law enforcement. And our office, while we are situated in Manhattan, uh, see this all the time because our jurisdiction is in Manhattan, but because of the confluence of uh, industry uh, and, uh, and banking and other businesses in Manhattan, um, the crimes we investigate are not confined by our borders. 
or our state lines. Uh, we have jurisdiction over cases that may be uh, crimes that may be committed by people far away from Manhattan. Uh, recently, at the end of an eight-year investigation, we prosecuted cyber thieves uh, from as far away as the Ukraine, uh, the mastermind of which we caught when he left the Ukraine to go on a vacation in Greece uh, after we had dropped an arrest warrant on him uh, with the assistance of Interpol. So we are actually investigating and bringing to the United States people who are far distant uh, and who are working in large groups to make a profit off the United States businesses and people using cybercrime and theft of intellectual property. Uh, second, the, the, the criminals who are involved in intellectual property theft aren't street criminals, uh, certainly anymore, protecting their turf with guns or knives. Uh, the choice of weapons of the uh, cyber thief uh, is the computer. Uh, and as you all know, they are using it extremely effectively to pursue the hard-earned capital the intellectual property of our businesses. And third, these criminals today, I think, importantly, we should not forget this, are threatening not just our economy, not just our business data, but increasingly threaten the health uh, of our citizens and well-being more generally. One of the most serious and alarming threats we see today in our office is the sale of counterfeit prescriptions, which directly impact vulnerable populations, like children, the elderly, or the infirm. Between 1 and 2 percent of all prescriptions sold in North America is counterfeit, according to the uh, 2013 World Health Organization report. Now, buying a fake Marc Jacobs bag, uh, buying a fake Rolex watch, <clears throat> buying uh, fake gray bands isn't going to hurt you, uh, but taking a counterfeit prescription medication medicine can kill you. And this is a real threat that I know many of you in this room are taking seriously. We are in our office very interested in hearing from representatives of the pharmaceutical industry about these issues. Uh, I know we'll hear from one of the panelists today from Pfizer and perhaps other companies about this threat. Um, and uh, I think we all got to pay careful attention to this in the future. And I think when you look more broadly, what we've seen in the papers and investigations that we are now doing, the global marketplace is now more than ever filled with examples of counterfeit merchandise that threaten the public safety, not just economy. Baby formula, toothpaste, motor vehicles, tires, electronics, and airline equipment. Modern, modern intellectual property thieves flood the market with their products with no regard for consumer safety and no concern for reputational damage. Beyond these consumer goods, we also see corporations unknowingly buying counterfeit software, which obviously places those companies' security and, and, uh, and businesses at risk. As we tackle this in New York State now, I'm also aware that our state laws in the area of intellectual property and cyber theft and cybercrime need to be reevaluated and updated. Uh, recognizing that need for a more comprehensive modernization of our laws, when I was president of the District Attorneys Association last year, we convened a task force made up of prosecutors, defense lawyers, industry experts, academicians, uh, and others uh, to study our laws in this area from top to bottom to make recommendations in a report not based on politics, but based on substance, how New York needs to update its laws in the white collar crime arena. And the proposed areas of change in that report uh, across a wide range of areas, but included certainly cyber crime and identity theft. As to those specific crimes, what the task force found and what I also see is that computer and other high tech crimes are simply in New York State not treated with the gravity and breadth harm that they actually cause us all. And let me give you just one simple example of the frustrations we have. Current law in New York does not treat stealing computer code or personal identification information as a theft. And that's because of antiquated larceny laws that don't allow for theft of duplication. Now that makes really no sense. Uh, and we all know in this room that theft of computer code 
from a business can be extraordinarily valuable and extraordinarily costly to the company. And that's why our task force has an example for both changing the definition of larceny in New York State to allow for theft of code software and some personal information as well. The bottom line is, as we look at our New York penal laws, they need to be updated to acknowledge what constitutes a crime in today's digital landscape. Despite the challenges that we have in, this, uh, in the statutes uh, and the need for their modernization, uh, we're going to continue in our office uh, to bring criminal charges for unlawful duplication and possession of computer-related material. And that's going to include situations where a current employee has permission to access or duplicate computer material, but then duplicates that data for some other unauthorized purpose. Our office recently indicted a programmer uh, for Goldman Sachs uh, for taking proprietary computer code from the company and then sharing it with a competitor. And that's just one example. In the near future, we're going to see more prosecutions like that from our office. One case will involve employees with stealing intellectual property related to the company's high-frequency trading strategies in the hopes of it to use to start their own trading firm. And the investigation that was set in motion uh, came about as a result of the victim corporation alerting our office. As part of that investigation, we were able to secure and essentially freeze the stolen code in cloud computing services, where it had been stored as part of the criminal scheme. And that's just an example of how private industry and law enforcement can work cooperatively together to deter the theft of intellectual property and hold those who are stealing it accountable. So uh, as I, as I uh, turn it over to the panel, I hope today's conference will be as useful to you as I know it will be for the lawyers in our office. And I know also that our success in combating intellectual property crimes and theft is really only as good and strong as the partnership that we have all together in this room. Our success in street crime, and we've had great success, is really a partnership as a result of a partnership between the communities we serve and law enforcement that's privileged to represent. In this area, success will come as a result of a partnership between the community of those who are directly affected by intellectual property crimes and theft and law enforcement. So today, I think, is another step forward toward bringing our communities closer and having our county be safer and our businesses more secure as well. So thank you very much, all of you, for being here today. Uh, David Suchman, who heads our investigation division, is now going to take over. And I hope you have a great morning, and that it's interesting and worthwhile to you, and that if you have issues or concerns in this area, uh, that you feel free to contact our office uh, and uh, the FBI, who is well represented here today, and the U.S. Attorney's Office. Thank you very much.
uh, really goes without saying that he is a national expert. He was an assistant United States attorney in the Eastern District of New York uh, and did that as the chief of their cybercrime program. He was also chief of their narcotics program. He was also senior litigation counsel. And he did have some private law firm experience prior to that working at Skadden Arts. So we are thrilled today to hear uh, Eric's perspective on the topic that we're here to discuss today. And without further ado, Eric, please, thank you. state-sponsored actors are using computers and cyber crime and cyber espionage to begin to wage war. Uh, and the, the space has entirely changed, and I think it's uh, quite visionary of you, visionary of you to uh, build the unit, understanding <coughs> it's going to become more and more important space, and my comments today, I think, are going to be directed a, a, a bit to that. Um, I'm going to focus on two types of uh, intellectual property, uh, I mean, really one type of intellectual uh, property theft uh, that we focus in on at Strauss Friedberg. And uh, at Strauss Friedberg, what we do is we do the digital forensics, the cybercrime response, and the remediation to figure out uh, what has happened to your network, how did these guys get in, what did they take, how to close the holes, and how to make sure it never happens again. And that's really the challenge that's facing corporate America now because they're under siege. Uh, I think that it was estimated by the government that approximately 700 to 1,000 companies have had their entire networks compromised, and top, top companies, Fortune 500, you know, and Fortune 1,000 companies have had their top networks compromised by uh, either insiders or state-sponsored agents who are stealing billions and billions of dollars worth of intellectual property. And the reason for that is it's very expensive to invest in the R&D to uh, generate that intellectual property. It's cheaper to steal it. Uh, so uh, many of, the, uh, of our adversaries around the world are trying to steal technology about how to make a drug, how to better build a bridge, how to build a new nuclear reactor, how to maintain a nuclear reactor how to recruit candidates uh, from, we just recently did a, uh, an investigation in which a headhunting firm was intruded upon for the intelligence that it had on uh, high quality candidates that were getting placed in very sensitive positions. So one of the purposes of this was to figure out 
who is going to be in various countries doing what for various military installations and for various government installations. But think of it also this way. I was taught, I mean, sometimes it's hard to, to figure out what the motive of the attacker is just from the content that you're looking for. But uh, in this case, it struck me that people were, that, that government agencies were looking to build profiles of individuals that would um, enable them to recruit spies or try to put people or get people to be double agents, etc., uh, based on the intelligence from a headhunting firm. Now, whoever thought 10 years ago that a headhunting firm would be the cyber victim uh, at the hands of uh, the Chinese government, as it were, in this case, it's almost unthinkable. Sometimes you think, okay, I understand uh, defense contractors and brain technology and drone technology, we understand that. <coughs> but it seems to be evolving that there's really no limit, and this is a real problem for corporate America. It's hard to figure out when you're going to be in the crosshairs of the attacker because it's not clear what they are going to value. And what it's turning out to be that they value pretty much anything that is high quality information. And it could be for a variety of reasons. It could be for manufacturing reasons, it could be for R&D, it could be for espionage, it could be in the case of organized crime groups, uh, they're very much focused on uh, invading areas that enable them to either wire transfer money out of institutions, get non-public information from networks on which they can trade. Uh, so really, the attacks have gotten incredibly serious and escalated, you know, quite remarkably. Um, with respect to so, there are a number of kinds of threats that Mr. Vance uh, alluded to, and in the intellectual property area, the insider threat is really one of the top threats. Um, many of these cases. In the case of Mr. Vance alluded to, the Omenikov case, was an insider that's behind the firewall. Right? In other words, so you have the quality of your firewall, the quality of your intrusion detection, somewhat is irrelevant because the person is behind all of that. And we see people, uh, oddly enough, very frequently in the high frequency trading area, stealing source code to go to another firm, build uh, a platform based on kind of uh, uh, source code that's available at their very fingertips. And so, whether it's insider or uh, outside threat, there are sort of three top things that companies can do to prepare and defend against this kind of threat. Number one, believe it or not, has nothing to do with technology. <coughs> it's corporate governance, all right? Corporate governance means IT guy doesn't own this anymore just by himself. He doesn't own the our problem or she does not own the problem. The entire organization at the C-suite and the board has to own this problem. Why? Because you need budget and you need to do change management in order to be effectively protected. I'll give you an example. Like at Goldman Sachs, there's no USB uh, connectivity allowed anywhere in the organization. Well, imagine if you've got a company where um, it's critical for the scientist or whatever to use USB sticks. The head of IT is never going to have the chops or the gravitas to by himself tell your entire either revenue producing uh, cadre or, or uh, uh, key personnel, I'm closing down all the USB ports. You need change management, you need education, you need buy in. You need the whole corporate culture to be able to sort of say, we are going to govern security together. It's not just an IT function. And we're going to say as a company together that security is as, as important or as critical to revenue production. If you do not, I, when I see companies where the attackers can just come in and plunder at will, nine times out of 10, it's because the IT guy has just been left to his own devices, and there's no board involvement, there's no CEO involvement, the audit committee is not involved at all in protecting the environment. <coughs> and so, in this
this case, for example, a lot of times source code, as it exists in an environment, uh, exists in a way that's easily accessible to anybody, especially to developers. And, and talk about corporate governance and change management. In, in a case where you have source code being developed in your environment, I would say in eight out of 10 companies, all the developers are allowed to remote in from home and work on the source code development remotely. They can VPN in, they can check into their source code platform, there's no logging of who's into the source code platform or what, they can copy stuff out. And so what ends up happening is that when you have a criminal case where uh, you know, there's been a theft of source code, it gets very muddy because it seems as if there's no way to prove unauthorized access or somebody, as Mr. Vance has alluded to, exceeding their authorized access because essentially the IT guys and the source code developers have free range essentially to do whatever they want. They have the ability to copy this stuff to their drives at home. They have the ability to put it on a USB drive. So when you do the search warrant and you do the, uh, the search warrant uh, of the person or the home, uh, as, what, as, as happened in, in the Elena Cop case, and the source code is on USB drives and it's on home computers, the person says, well, this was the normal course of doing business. I'm allowed to do this. I do this, and we all do that. That's how we develop the source code. And it makes unauthorized access prosecutions or exceeding authorized access through prosecutions uh, under 18 U.S.C. 1030 extremely difficult. And so what has to happen is you have to lock all that down. You have to have a source code repository that says, okay, you can only access this from the network, let's say. Maybe that's the decision you make. You can't access it remotely. And if you access it remotely, you can't download the software. You can't put it down to USB. Well, can you imagine if you've got a bunch of incredibly valiant, they're usually Russian scientists in the uh, high frequency trading area that have the ability to generate these algorithms that do computer algorithmic trading. And you say to all of them that you're paying for five, Right now, uh, we, for example, have a, uh, 
sector. Uh, the government loves this stuff as a sort of an anti Robert Hansen type of uh, technology. <coughs> so privacy issues to that uh, in the intelligence community is uh, getting more traction. But there are emerging sentiment analysis technologies that allow you to keep an eye on these people that are extremely highly well, well positioned to steal your crown jewels. So again, you can almost see, like think about this, the, the technology we need, uh, uh, we call it rapport. How are you, is the IT guy at any institution, at a financial institution, going to be able to impose this technology that reads and scores every email for all these psychological factors that might that we have reverse engineered as being associated with impending digital doom. Are you, is the IT person herself going to be able to implement that? You know, say, hey, I made this purchase and I put it on the exchange server. You know, that's a C-level issue. The board, the outside counsel, everybody's going to have to sign off on that. You know, because it has massive ramifications. Half your employees are, in fact, might say, I'm not working at this company. If you put that in on Google, right? If you put that technology at Google, you're losing 75% of your staff. Now, if you're at a, a trading firm, for example, and everybody's taking 10, 20, 30 million dollars, they might say, well, I understand you gotta watch me and you know, it's a little more uh, acceptable. So again, you get back to the issue of uh, uh, corporate governance. Um, so there are specific technologies, there are specific methodologies, and especially for insider threat, you know, there's a vast body of, of knowledge, mostly aggregated uh, at Carnegie Mellon, who has done, you know, years and years of studies of insider threats and profiles of who is it that goes, you know, I'll just go postal inspector here, uh, who goes, you know, postal as it were, you know, on, on other folks to steal stuff and just, just goes off the reservation and really threatens the organization with this kind of intellectual property stuff and other harm like these destructive actions that happened at Gucci. Well, there's a way of profiling that. First of all, you have to screen for it when you're hiring, right? So again, if the HR person is just doing their own thing in a non-cross-disciplinary context, how does the HR person know that your organization's specifically interested in targeting you know, background check and pro, uh, psychological profiling of your key people, both when you first hire them and then as you continue to sort of look at them, uh, as, as, the, as the case may be over time, to see whether or not they're likely candidates for this kind of disgruntlement uh, and entitled, sense of entitlement that leads to this kind of intellectual property theft. They can't do it by themselves. They would never come up with that. They need, again, leadership from the top. And so what we see in best practices is cross-disciplinary fields where, in many cases, a whole planning session and incident preparedness catches this stuff early. I remember, I remember once doing a case uh, where it was for a uh, big franchise, and two of the people were sniffing, they were secretly recording off the wires that run through the wall, everybody's AOL instant messages, which were unencrypted, uh, just for fun, really. but they were, then they were making, wreaking havoc with them just uh, amongst the staff. And we came in and did the investigation, and we found the secret laptops that were recording all this, that we figured out who it who, who was doing it, and we interviewed 20 of the people in the company. Don't you know that four of the people knew this was going on? And they knew it was going on for six months. Now, when, 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 the, when the intellectual property's been wired out, it's too late to have the time, it's gone. It goes to you know, China, it goes to Russia, it goes to Syria, it goes to wherever, it goes to an industrial competitor. But there are always signs in advance that you've got a problem.
about theft of intellectual property, theft of uh, it, 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 monitoring the chairman's emails surreptitiously for six months. Four, five, six people have known this for going on for a long time. Now, what's wrong with that picture? You have no way, it's a little bit like the fourth foot situation, you know, obviously it's a much more tragic situation, where people still had a sense that there was a problem, but there wasn't a proper, pro, proper mechanism for escalation. There was no education, there was no incident response plan, there was no mechanism on the HR side to sort of say, I believe in the fourth foot area. People thought, as when they did the interviews, hey, this guy seems a little wacky. Like he's making all these sort of anti government statements. But as I recall, a lot of the people that really had concerns were uh, uh, worried that <coughs> they came forward because the person was uh, a Muslim, that there would be a perception that they were being uh, retaliatory or racist or prejudiced against them by reporting what they properly saw as behavior that was indicative that was going to lead to trouble. And I see that over and over and over in the cyberspace. Because you find out that, I mean, some of the times the, the three or four people that know are, are involved. But a lot of times they're not. And a lot of times the harm could have been prevented had proper procedures been put in on the, on the human resources side to give people a mechanism to come forward to sort of escalate this problem and uh, bring it to the right people's attention. I see that happening sometimes. Um, so again, you think it's all about technology, but it's not. It's about lots of other things that you have to put in. Um, we've seen on the, uh, on the outside where attackers are looking for information and intellectual property. It's a few security firms, it's defense industrial base, manufacturing, financial, oil and gas, engineering, law firms. Law firms are a huge target right now, and they're looking for valuable intellectual property and valuable intelligence about corporate clients because they think that the law firms are less protected and it would be easier to get information from them. We've seen it in the headhunting area. We've seen it in the public relations sector. It's really not anywhere that there's something valuable in intellectual property, you are at risk. Uh, I was lecturing yesterday with uh, the, the vice president of compliance for, for uh, um, one of the big, a smallish investment management firm. I mean, it was, you know, billions of dollars, or small billions, not big billions. And, uh, he was saying, well, I don't really think that they're really that big of a target. The thing is, you never know. I mean, a lot of times, especially in this context, you become associated in the attacker's mind, sometimes by association. I, I did a case many years ago for Bank of New York Mellon. Um, and I think the U.S. Attorney's Office in uh, uh, Jersey ended up prosecuting this, where they were under tremendous cyber threat because they were the bank that had handled the bank accounts for an animal testing company. And the attackers were a very militant animal uh, rights group that then targeted uh, all of the, this company over and over and over with digital and physical attacks because of the, this guilt by association. And we've seen this in the cyber area where attacks come in because people are representing people associated with somebody that's adverse, for example, to Julian Assange. So you could be in some completely weird, like eBay. Did eBay ever think that it was going to come under attack because it shut down the payment mechanism to WikiLeaks? So again, uh, it all comes down to these things, corporate governance, technologies that are specific to the threats, and in the cyber area uh, where you're involving state-sponsored uh, uh, espionage uh, uh, by uh, state-sponsored actors, you have
have to have technologies that are unique to that kind of attack. So there's a whole new range of technologies that are emerging to act as intrusion detection for state-sponsored and persistent attacks. So again, you know, especially as inside counsel, sometimes inside counsel thinks, well, you know, that's an IT thing. Inside counsel, purchasing, the CEO, all have to be involved in that because these technologies are expensive. They become obsolete for various years. A new technology gets uh, 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 invented you know, three years after what you bought, and the change management and the budgeting issues that come about by having to replace those technologies as you go uh, requires C-suite uh, 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 involvement. And I think the last point I would make, uh, there's a deck that's available on this, uh, on this site here uh, that, that deals specifically with um, again, persistent threat. If anybody wants that, I would like to make it available to them. The, the last leg of this is world-class incident response personnel, either on an inside or an outsourced basis. Those are sort of the three legs of the stool. Because whether it's insider threat or it's battling Russia, China, Syria, you know, whoever it is, a state sponsor, Israel, France, you know, it could be anyone, us, uh, you know, it could be anybody. Um, you have to have personnel that are highly trained as incident responders. And one of the issues that especially companies are facing is that these people are very hard to find and extremely expensive. And they jump around, they go over $10,000 or $20,000 more. So it's very hard to retain them. So these kind of attacks where people can do log analysis and understand how to run these intrusion detection systems and understand on the insider threat how to run these very specific technologies that purport to be predictive, like ours, of harm. You have to have highly technical people, and they're really not thousands Cyber. They have they have good, uh, very good cyber <coughs> training, but they go to a handful of firms, and then the government sort of scoops a lot of these folks up. What corporations are now doing is they're trying to attract those people, bring some of those resources in house, and then if you if you, if you come under attack, either insider or outside attack, uh, you, you normally have to scale with outside providers, but at least you have a quarterback that has the technical resources and the technical understanding about how to do the log analysis, how to do the forensic analysis, how to do the adequate preservations, how to li liaison with law enforcement. It's a very unique set of skills. So for, your, for the corporate folks here, I mean, those are the people you should really be thinking about hiring uh, internally to your organization and then have them be part of this cross-disciplinary. Uh, so thank you for your time this morning.